book by Brahma Gupta. About 625. And that is all that he did. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more. Now, you didn't have trigonometric functions, but the law of cosines is in Euler. It's there with v times cosine a just represented as a, a, a segment. And we don't know how Brahmagupta did it. Uh, proofs weren't common in the Indian thing. But there's more in Brahmagupta's book than this. One of the formulas that Brahmagupta does in this book is the formula for the area of a cyclic quadrilateral. By the way, he never mentions the fact that the quadrilaterals that he's dealing with have vertices that lie in a circle. And there have been people through the centuries who castigate him for that. But there's a nice article by an Indian mathematician who's a professor in France, differential equations, in a recent issue of Historia Mathematica, where he points out a particular word that is used by Brahmagupta in Sanskrit when he's dealing with cyclic quadrilaterals. And there was no question in my mind that he knew what he was doing. He was far too good a mathematician. This was translated by Colebrook, published about 1820. And Ramagupta also gave formulas for the segments of the diagonals. Colebrook says that he doesn't give the proof because there have been corrupted. Uh, but Brahmagupta said you can do this by proportions, and you can. Let me just write down what one of the formulas that he has. Uh, let's see. I want the one that involves A, B. I call that T. So T is A, B times the square root of AC plus BD over AB plus CD times AD plus BC. And in fact, you can do it with proportions. And he does more than that. Let me redraw the picture so that I can get one of his needles in. You extend the, the sides of the cyclic quadrilateral and get what he calls the needles. And you can find these <coughs> lengths. And then since you had these lengths already, you can add them together. And you get nice formulas for all of that. Then in the 19th century, and I'm not sure exactly where. It's probably in a paper of Brett Schneider in the early 1840s. But the first place it appears in a book that I know of is Hobson's plane and advanced trigonometry. You draw the two needles and then you connect them and get what's called the third diagonal. Now, Hobson doesn't give a complete proof of this. He does give a proof of how you get the pieces of this. And then he quotes a theorem from a book by McDowell on geometry that he uses to find the third diagonal. I'll tell you what the formula is in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and I tried to find a book by McDowell on geometry. And I found one. But the title is different. The theorem is there, but it's on a different page by missing by about 20. So there may be another book of by McDowell that I don't know about, or maybe Hobson was a little bit sloppy in his note taking. There's also a, an advanced geometry book by Durrell and <coughs> Robeson, which has been reprinted uh, by Chelsea, uh, not by Dover. And they give a series of problems uh, 
working through finding all the pieces of the, the segments and the needles. And then they quote a theorem from Durrell's uh, modern geometry uh, to get the needles. Uh, but again, they don't give a proof of that. But you don't need that. And I was giving a talk at West High School in Madison last fall to the undergrad, to the high school math club. And I started off with the proof that I gave using the law of cosines. And I also gave some motivation for Ptolemy's theorem. How could somebody have thought about this? And that's an interesting problem to think about, because there are a number of interesting special cases where you can work things out directly. Of course, a rectangle, a right-angled kite using areas, and then one other I'll get to in just a minute. And I, I got to, the, and I didn't do the, the pieces of it because I wanted to leave that to the students. And I said, I'll give a copy of a translation of a great Russian geometry book, uh, Kislev's uh, Planimetry, that Sasha Gimentel out of Berkeley uh, translated and published. And the, the name of the publishing firm that he has, uh, he set it up himself. It is the most interesting name. Samizdat. <laughs> the Russians all laugh. <laughs> Samizdat is self-publishing, or we thought of it as clandestine publishing. And so this is clandestine mathematics publishing. <laughs> and he said, I'd give a copy of that to the school library if any of you can find the third diagonal. Right after the, the talk was over, somebody came up to me and said the third diagonal is this. And it was wrong for two reasons. One, it didn't scale right. If you double the radius, you have to double the, the diagonal. And there's also one other special case when you have an isosceles <coughs> trapezoid, which is cyclic. One of the needles doesn't exist, and it doesn't exist, of course, then for a rectangle. And so when two of the opposite sides are equal, the third needle has to be infinite. And that didn't satisfy that. I got an email from another student that night with his guess as to what it was. And I told both of them, don't try to guess the answer. <laughs> Follow Brahmagupta's suggestion and do it a step at a time using proportions. And the next morning I got an email from the second student uh, with the right formula for what it was. And I probably can remember it, but let me write down what it really is. If this is Z and we have the same A, B, C, D. The Z squared is A, B plus C, D, A, D plus B, C times AC over A squared minus C squared squared plus BD over B squared minus D squared squared. Now, I expect Doran to sit down and do all this stuff with a computer. But I have one request, and that is you don't put the final formula on for the third diagonal. You say that can be found, but just leave it off the web so that we can give it to students. <laughs> uh, I once read that you couldn't use Walter Rudin's uh, Principles of Mathematical Analysis anymore as a text, because every problem in the book has a solution on the web. <laughs> and we have to keep some things off the web. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Now I'm going to say a bit more about Ptolemy's theorem, <coughs> but let me, let, me, let me tell you a solution. We do computer-generated problems. Let the computer generate the problems randomly, and then you can have many, many problems that haven't been ever made before. Uh, the problem with that is that when you're working with a graduate student, and if you expect the graduate student, most graduate students, to find their own problem, the problems are either too easy or too hard. And there's a small class of problems that are accessible at any given time. 
and computers 